So uh, welcome everyone to the 11th week of this uh, seminar series on mechanics of materials. Today we have uh, Professor uh, William Curtin from uh, EPFL Switzerland. So I'll just give a, a brief introduction of the speaker. Uh, Professor uh, Curtin uh, received his uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in physics from Brown University in 1981 and a PhD in theoretical physics from Cornell University in 86. So after working for a few years in, uh, in the applied physics group at British Petroleum Research Lab, he joined the faculty at Virginia Tech in 1993 with a joint appointment in material science and engineering and engineering science and mechanics. In 1998, Professor Curtin returned to Brown University as a faculty member in the solid mechanics group of the Division of Engineering, where he was appointed as the Elisha Benjamin Andrews Professor in 2006. At Brown, he has served as the director of the Center for Advanced Materials Research, director of the NSF Materials Research Science and Engineering Center, and founding director of the General Motors and uh, Brown Collaborative Research Lab on Computational Materials. Professor Curtin joined the Institute of Mechanical Engineering at EPFL as Institute Director in 2011, and currently he heads the Laboratory for me Multiscale Mechanics Modeling at EPFL. So the major theme of Professor Curtin's research is uh, modeling of the mechanical behavior of materials with special emphasis on fracture and multiscale modeling. Systems uh, of interest uh, at, uh, that are being investigated include uh, metals such as magnesium and uh, aluminum magnesium alloys, high entropy alloys, as well as uh, various types of composite materials. He has published over 180 scientific papers in peer reviewed journals and presented many invited talks at national and international venues. So uh, we thank Professor Curtin for invite, uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, giving the seminar. Uh, so he'll be talking today about coupling atomistics and discrete dislocation dynamics in 3D. So I'll hand over the floor to Professor Curtin. Great, thanks very much, Sham. Uh, so it's a pleasure to uh, be with you virtually. I say it's admirable, it's Friday night, 9 p.m. in India, and some of you are actually online watching a, a technical presentation. Um, so that uh, shows some dedication. Um, I was uh, thinking about topics to talk about for an applied mechanics uh, group for the most part. We're doing a lot more, uh, a lot more mechanics and materials way down at the atomic scale and uh, a lot more computational metallurgy. So I decided to talk about something that's in between, which is bridging the atoms to the continuum and particularly to dislocations. And that's, uh, this coupled atomistic discrete dislocation method, uh, but in full 3D, and you'll see uh, the 3D aspects uh, in a few minutes, but coupling atomistic dislocations, which have complex structure and, dis and continuum dislocations, which are line defects through some sort of uh, coupling mechanisms. So this work uh, has been done in collaboration with Jean-François Molinari in the LSMS lab, uh, his student Jehun Cho, postdoc Thiel Junga, who's now working in my lab, a PhD student uh, who's now finished, Max Hodap, another student, Ben Shaevsky, Anka Gupta is now working, he, he came from uh, IAT Madras uh, and is working with me now on the next uh, generation of some of this. I'll ch chat uh, about that at the end. And uh, it's funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation. So uh, let me talk a little bit at the beginning about dislocation and plasticity. And then, yeah. Professor Curtin, if, uh, if I can oh, yeah. interject for a second, uh, I just had a message for the participants. So we usually take uh, questions at the end. So if you have questions during the talk, please type them into the Q&A box in your, uh, on your screen. And uh, we'll, we'll take the questions uh, in turn at the end. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. So please go ahead. No, okay. that's okay. Okay, yeah, uh, the, the online is a little hard to uh, manage. So I will just move forward. So I'll talk about this CAD method. Uh, I'll talk about some of the challenges. Then I'll talk about the concept and a bit about the algorithms that we use. And then I'll spend a lot of time uh, showing some calibration, some validation examples. And uh, the 3D is, uh, you know, it's Friday night. So I'll show a lot of movies um, rather than going into all of the minute details of how one has to do this coupling, uh, I'll show you a lot of examples uh, as we go along, to, and you'll see all the aspects that we had to um, that we have to overcome. 
So uh, we're in the field of mechanics and materials, and uh, you all are in this field as well. And I find it's a, an interesting field because it really impacts uh, um, engineering systems from the very beginning, how you make materials and process them, how they evolve while they're being used, their performance, how they fall apart, all the way across. And then here's a set of pictures with all kinds of scales, um, the aerospace scale, the nanoscale, energy generation, power generation, batteries, nano uh, mechanical devices, biomedical. And so it's a really uh, cross-cutting discipline. And we take this one set of, of tools in, in mechanics and materials, but we can apply it to all kinds of different problems. Uh, so I, it's, it's a really uh, fun area to work in. And it's also very multi-scale that uh, you can see many different scales here, but the, and the physics requires us to go down in scale while the applications require us to go up in scale. And so we really have to pay attention to the scale bridging methods. Um, now, when we look at metals in particular, and that's what I'll focus on with dislocations today, the performance depends on features from the angstrom scale to the millimeter scale. And if we work our way down, if I just uh, take a micrograph of a material, I see it's polycrystalline. These are different grains of a metal. This, this is a, uh, a cast material with dendritic structure. This is a, a dual phase steel with uh, austenite and ferrite phases. And all of this is happening at the 10 to 100 micron scale. And all of this structure, this microstructure is important for the performance. But at the same time, in all of these materials, there are interfaces. And the interfaces, like grain boundaries and phase boundaries, are atomistic. And so we have to worry about both the large scale microstructure and some atomistic features uh, if we're interested in fracture and deformation. Now, if I go down in scale, look a little more closely, I see inside these grains or inside these, uh, these phases of material are dislocation networks and that controls the plasticity. But this is again at a scale of a several microns where the dislocations are interacting and forming forest structures. But of course, the dislocation itself is an atomistic scale defect. And so at this scale, we still have the atomistic parts uh, that we have to worry about. And if I zoom in even more closely and look at an atomic probe uh, um, tomography study, you can see the actual chemistry of an alloy and you see that there can be precipitates, there can be dislocation lines, and now we're down at the nanometer scale. And if you really zoom in, you can see that the species can aggregate to dislocation lines and we're down here at the atomistic scale. And this behavior can affect ultimately what happens at the larger scale. So, we have to deal with these multi-scale features because things going on at the small scale influence what's going on at the high scale. But I can't study only what goes on at the small scale because these things at the higher scale, whether it's a dislocation network scale, a microstructure scale, also participate, also contribute to the properties. So unlike many, many other fields where you can just deal with uh, the chemistry at a small scale, we really have to go beyond and up and down in scales. And many times we can work at the continuum scale and not worry about the smaller scale. But if we want to control the new physics, we want to design new materials, we have to go across scales. So the physics of plasticity is atomistic. It, it is about dislocations. So let me remind you about dislocations. So what is a dislocation? It's a line defect that terminates planes of slip. So if I have a crystal, and here's a simple cubic, simple crystal structure, if the top part of the material slips relative to the bottom part of the material, and it displaces by a vector, the Berger's vector, that reproduces the perfect lattice, you don't see the slip here, but these atoms here used to be over here above this atom. And by slipping, I reproduce the lattice. But at some point, the slipping stops, and I have the lattice further away that was never slipped at all. And so there's a boundary between the slipped region, which is this gray slip surface, and the unslipped region. And that boundary, that curved line, is a dislocation line. Now, the line is characterized by the amount of slip, which is the Berger's vector, and that's associated with crystallography. 
but the line could be oriented along the Burgers vector. That's a screw dislocation. It could be oriented perpendicular to the Burgers vector. That's an edge dislocation or anything in between. But there's this singular line, when we think about it mathematically, a singular line between slipped and unslipped. And I see some of my uh, video, some of my stuff is not uh, is overlapping here, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. And uh, so this picture, which is now has the writing behind it, not sure why, uh, shows that if I push on a material, it will deform by starting to form a dislocation. This is an extra plane of atoms, but this is the termination of slip. And then the plastic flow is the slip moving through the material until I get permanent plastic deformation. And so it's the motion of this line defect, which slips the crystal on whatever slip planes I have, that generates what we see as macroscopic plasticity. And so we can describe this dislocation defect at various scales, but the atomic scale details of exactly how I go from a slipped region to an unslipped region, how I transition from slip to unslip, that's where the dislocation is, but how that happens, right? those things really set the flow stress for the material and how that transition region interacts with uh, solutes and precipitates and grain boundaries, that determines all the physics of the plasticity. So the atomic details are really important. And if you don't think the atomic details are important for a minute, you might say, well, why are different metals different? Totally different behavior of typical metals is due to their atomic structure. Right? Aluminum is FCC, face-centered cubic. Iron is BCC, body-centered cubic. Titanium is HCP, uh, hexagonally close packed. The, the behavior, the plastic behavior of these materials is totally different because the dislocations are different because the tr crystal structure is different. The crystal structure is different means the slip terminates in different ways. And so FCC, the dislocations can glide very easily on 111 planes. In, in BCC materials, the dislocations are very, very compact in structure and it's very hard to move a screw dislocation. In an HC material, you have all kinds of slip planes. You have basal planes and prismatic planes and pyramidal planes. And each one of these has a different slip system and they all compete with one another. If you go to a continuum scale, open a textbook about dislocations, it says a dislocation has a Burgers vector. It's a line defect with a Burgers vector. That says nothing about how the slip terminates. And so you have to go into the crystal structure to decide why these metals are different. And at the continuum scale, that's all lost. So there's a lot you can do at the continuum scale, but fundamentally what's underneath that is some atomic scale structure. So that's why the, the dislocation of plasticity is ultimately, um, is ultimately coming from the atomic structure. Now, of course, we can't do everything at the atomic scale and our motivation is to cover these scales from continuum deformation in a component to dislocation representation where there are little dislocations in here you can't see, down to an atomistic representation, uh, in fact, even for something like a crack tip, uh, and then possibly even down to the quantum mechanical scale if, if we really need new chemistry in the material. And so we wanna be able to cover all of these. And so we need to be able to bridge the scales in plasticity. Sometimes we can do that by taking information from one scale and giving it to another. This is a message passing or a, a um, hierarchical modeling, but sometimes we wanna deal with these problems uh, concurrently all at the same time. Atomistics in one region, dislocations in another, continuum at another, so that we can get the atomistic details. And so we often need to mix these atomistic scale phenomena and some sort of mesoscale phenomena. And here's an example. Um, this uh, picture on the bottom is a cut on the slip plane of an aluminum alloy with these green precipitates in it, or look green, and the, the fields, the red and the blue are the residual stress fields, and this purple line is a dislocation moving through this material, and it may be cutting the precipitates or looping around them, that depends on the details of the precipitates, but this is a 6,000 standard 6,000 series alloy, and we're trying to model the plasticity by looking at the dislocations going through. But to understand whether these, whether the dislocations will cut the precipitate, which 
creates a new surface or will loop around it, we have to go down to a smaller scale. And here's an atomistic model that we've just uh, working on of this very complex precipitate. It has a 22 atom monoclinic unit cell. It's a special beta double prime precipitate. And here's an edge dislocation going, trying to go around and either cut through or loop around this, this precipitate. And that's ultimately what's going on down here. And so somehow I have to take this information and embed it in here so that I can follow the dislocation motion. And I could try to pass information from the, from the small scale to the large scale, or I could try to model part of this as continuum and part of it explicitly atomistic at the same time to do something uh, that is in a coupled way. And ultimately, we want predictive continuum laws. Right? Um, if we want phenomenological laws in fitting, we can do that. But if we want to really understand why is this precipitate giving strength, and if I had a different precipitate, what would the strength be? I have to deal with this problem at a smaller scale, and I have to make it predictive. It's not enough to say, oh, it's about this or about that. It would really need to be quantitative. So to couple scales between dislocations and atoms, we developed some years ago this coupled atomistic discrete dislocation model for 2D plane strain problems. So the domain it can be periodic in the through thickness direction. It's not a 2D problem, but it's periodic and it has a plane strain nature. So the atoms can see a little bit of 3D, but everything is pretty much 2D. And so here's a picture of this. This is, in, this is a scale of about eight microns in size. And what I have is a crack. And then around that is a material that's deforming plastically by discrete dislocations. Each of these little lines here is a dislocation line, which is perfectly straight in the plane. And so all I see is the projection of it into the plane. And these dislocations are moving around. They're the plastic zone around the crack. And then way down here, embedded inside here at the tip, is an atomistic domain where the crack tip is sitting because the crack tip can be emitting dislocations, it could, be, it could be cracking, it can be blunting. And so here we have the far field plasticity that's happening on the scale of microns, and we have the atomistic domain, which is where I could have chemicals here, I could have uh, corrosion, I could have uh, dislocation emission and blunting, all kinds of things that are fundamentally atomistic. And these two are intimately coupled. They're intimately coupled through a pad of atoms, this lighter gray set of atoms out here, that these atoms are, are positioned by the solution of a continuum problem out here, a dislocation problem, and they then give a boundary condition to the atoms. As I evolve the atoms, the, the interface right here, these atoms provide a boundary condition for the outer problem, and that then I can solve the outer problem by continuum methods. And by a not quite iterative, but almost iterative way, these two regions talk back and forth to one another. And the key for this, talking back and forth is one thing, but we also need dislocation defects, these, these slip to go in and out of the atomistic domain. And here you can see a dislocation that has uh, been coming in. It's creating a step on this outer boundary because this part's finite. You can see these other dislocations that have come in or gone out. I'm not quite sure which one. And that's blunting the crack. And then these other dislocations, some of these dislocations have gone out and they're out here in the continuum. Some are coming in from the, from the continuum into the atomistics. And it's fully coupled so that these dislocations can go back and forth. So the atomistic domain does not know that the region outside is actually a, a, a lower cost discrete dislocation domain. And the discrete dislocation domain sees what the atoms are doing and, and behaves accordingly. Now, in this 2D, as I said, the dislocations are now line defects that are perfectly aligned with this direction. And so, the, the motion of dislocation through the interface from inside to outside is relatively easy. It's not easy, but it's relatively easy because the dislocation is always either inside or outside. It, it never cross, it's never in crossing both at the same time. It's either a line inside or a line outside. So that part 
limits us to plane strain. The coupling between a continuum domain out here and an atomistic domain using a pad of atoms, this can be solved in a number of different ways and is generic to 2D and 3D. So I can do 2 and 3D coupling without enabling plasticity to go back and forth. But if I want plasticity to go back and forth, that's much more difficult. And we're able to achieve that in the 2D plane strain problems, but not in 3D. So this was a great start. We did this quite some years ago, but we were always faced with the problem of going to 3D was much more challenging. And when I moved to EPFL and we had a little bit more latitude with funding and I was with my colleague Jean-François Molinari, we thought, okay, now's the time to take on the challenging, challenging part of 3D and we think we know what we wanna do, so let's give it a try. So what's the problem in 3D? The main problem in 3D is that a single dislocation line, remember a termination, I'm saying a loop here, but I mean any kind of, it's a curved line in space. And so that curved line could in some places be in an atomistic domain and in other places be in a continuum domain. So the same line, which remember is a termination of slip, it's a singularity, the same line can exist in the atom and in the domain. And so if I look at this, here's a cutaway cartoon that my student Max Hodap made. In an atomistic domain over here on the left, the dislocation has some atomistic structure. In FCC, it's dissociated into two partial dislocations with a stacking fault. And I can draw a dashed line where the center of the dislocation is, but the dislocation is this complicated entity that's terminating the slip this part is slipped over here, and this part over here is not slipped. And I want to treat that with atomistics, full atomistics, say an uh, atomistic molecular dynamics simulator like LAMPS. Now, the continuum method treats the dislocation as a pure line defect. It has the Burgers vector, and it has the line that terminates slip from non-slipped region, but it's a line defect. It has no atomistic information. And now I can handle that problem using uh, discrete dislocation methods and the code such as Paradis and finite elements to calculate some fields if I need to. But these two methods, the discrete dislocation method and atomistics are totally different and totally different scale of resolution. And now for a single dislocation, this dislocation over here has an atomistic description and over here it has a continuum description. How do we match, how do we make sure that these, the dislocation over here is behaving properly and the dislocation here is behaving property, properly and that we don't create some sort of huge spurious forces right here where we're trying to couple these two totally different methods. And just to put a scale on things, when you think about the, uh, the stresses around the core of a dislocation, of course, in this, in the, continuum theory, they're singular, and right? it's, a, it's a singular field. In a non-singular theory, you can smooth them out a little bit, but the stresses are still gigapascal. In the atomistic system, if I ask, what are the atom, what are the stresses around this dislocation? They're gigapascal stresses. What's the stress to move a dislocation? In aluminum, to move an edge dislocation, the stress is maybe a few megapascals. So I have gigapascal stresses, singular and non-singular, and I'm asking the system to reproduce the correct stress on the scale of megapascals so the gliding of the dislocation is captured properly. So even if I make tiny errors in the coupling, I, this could be disastrous for the actual application of stress because I may, if I make an error of 1%, that might be 50 megapascals, that's huge. It's not acceptable. So it's very delicate to try to couple these two, these two problems. So how do we deal with the problem in general as a coupled multi-scale problem? Well, our favorite approach to doing any of these problems is domain decomposition. You solve two problems in the two different domains and then you couple them to make sure they talk properly. So if I look down on a slip plane, I have a dislocation in the slip plane and part of it is in an atomistic domain, omega A, and part of it is in an omega C, and this pad region that's in the continuum but talks to the atomistics is omega P. So here's the dislocation. Just think about one dislocation. 
And I decompose that into two problems. One is a continuum problem that is in this outer part of the domain, not, not, not inside this piece right here. It's all of this domain here. And then the other part is an atomistic problem. Now in the continuum problem, we break this problem up into two pieces by superposition. We break it up into a discrete dislocation description in infinite space, infinite space, no boundary conditions. And then we add a continuum solution with no dislocation, but with special boundary conditions to correct for the fact that the dislocation is in a finite space and not in an infinite space. I don't want to go through all that superposition, but it's a well-defined way to handle the continuum level problem. And the singularity of the dislocation line is captured in the analytic fields. And then all of the image forces and the boundary effects are captured in a smooth field problem. So this is the continuum problem. And then I have an atomistic problem where this part of the dislocation is moving in the atomistic domain. And I solve, want to solve these two problems uh, essentially at the same time. And they talk to one another through this, through this interface. But we never try to solve them uh, as one formulation. We never try to write down one entire energy functional for the whole system. Like you would do in FE, you just write down the energy and discretize it and solve. Or in atomistics, you have atoms, you have the energy, you minimize the energy or use, uh, use dynamics, right? Here, we have one method over here on, on the continuum side and one method over here on the atomistic side. And they're really incompatible, particularly with dislocations because this dislocation over here is singular and over here it's not singular. So we don't want to try to make them intimate. We want to try to domain decouple. So now what's the problem? The problem is, as I mentioned, these dislocation going from the continuum part into the atomistic part. And so how do we do this? Well, here's a cutaway of a portion of our material here. And I want to point out this section of material right here, the thicker section, is where the atoms are. And then this other little thin section here, which I've denoted down the bottom, is this pad region, which is where we're going to do the coupling. And so the atoms, the real atoms, they want to see a realistic dislocation coming from the continuum. So here's the continuum line, the dislocation line. And here are some discretized nodes of that line that we would use numerically. And that line is then coming in and going into the atomistic material. But in this pad region, where the continuum information is given to the atomistics, we don't use the continuum dislocation displacement field. That would be singular and would not match with the atomistic description. Instead, in a region around the dislocation core, where the dislocation is going in, we use the actual atomistic dislocation field. So in this white region, we tell the atoms to sit with the atomistic displacement field of a dislocation with this Berger's vector and this angle. Could be edge, could be screw, could be anything else. Okay. We impose that. And then everywhere else, we use the continuum field. So outside of this, we use the continuum field. So what we're doing from a, a numerical perspective is we're enriching the continuum solution. We have a continuum solution. We could write down that continuum field. And what we're doing is saying, well, on the degrees of freedom, which are now going to be atoms, we're adding, we're enriching that field by adding the actual true displacement field of the, of the atomistics. Okay. And we really do it as an enrichment. We first use this field and then we use the difference between these fields. But once we add them together, we get the true atomistic field. And so by this method, the atoms on the inside here are seeing what looks like a realistic atomistic core. And so they'll respond accordingly. They don't see the singular line coming in. And the singular line just needs to know where does the atomistic dislocation, where is it coming out? And then I can start my singular line. So this is this, this template which we can pre-compute tells us how to let the continuum dislocation tell the atoms what to do. 
Here's another picture of this. Remember, this is the picture I showed you where I have this atomistic dislocation and this line dislocation. And essentially what we're doing is taking a piece of atomistic dislocation and putting it right where the line dislocation terminates. And now the atomistic dislocation sees this continuous region. It sees these atoms in the pad region. It doesn't see some continuous line or, or line, which is a singular, singular field. It sees a correct representation of the atoms by we impose that right there. Okay. So this makes sure that these atomistic atoms are seeing real atoms. And the line is a kinematics. We just can find where the line is and the continuum can go on its merry way. So that's the part for how we talk. And then we have to think about an algorithm for advancing the dislocation. So imagine we have a system where we have a continuum dislocation and an atomistic dislocation over here. And initially it's straight and we wanna increment the system in time. So we increment the atomistic part and the DD part, both dislocations move forward, but the interface is fixed. When I move the, when I move the discrete dislocations, they do so with this boundary condition of an interface here. And when I move the atomistics, they do so with a fixed boundary condition. So I end up with this little kink here because the interface hasn't moved yet. But then I can look at the discrete dislocations and I can see this X here is where I identify in the atomistics, where's the dislocation. If I identify where it is in the, in the atomistics, I can now connect, create a new section of dislocation and I can now reposition my continuum dislocation and this template where I think it should be. And now it's more or less in the right place. The atoms are still seeing this structure, but this is like a little kink of a dislocation. The atoms immediately say, we don't want to do that. We want to line up with this nice field here. And the atoms move to line up with the final position of the dislocation. So there's two parts here. It's an incremental sort of staggered algorithm. At least that's the way it looks. Sometimes you can do the system simultaneously. But the discrete dislocations need to see a node inside the material that is treated as if it's part of the continuum. And by that means, we know where to put the interface because we know where the new atom is, where, where we know where that new atomistic dislocation is. And if we don't have that, then we can't evolve the interface and we can't tell the dislocation far away where it should be going. And so this node I'll show you is very important in the end, but it's just kind of providing a kinematic continuity between the atomistics and the continuum. Okay, now I'm just kind of sketching this out. To get everything to work requires quite a bit of effort. And so here are all the things. First, there's a ge the general algorithm for the evolution that mostly was done by, uh, with Kiv Junga. Then these core templates that we have to pre-compute was done by Jay Hoon and uh, Guillaume Ancio, who's a scientist in Molangari lab. The atomistic mobility, you have to calibrate your discrete dislocations. The discrete dislocations don't know all they know is the Berger's vector. You have to tell them how fast should you move under stress and what should your atomic structure be and what should your core energy be because none of those things are, those things are determined by the atomistics. The core energy, that was something that Ben Shaevsky worked on. You have to compute the displacement fields and dislocation, uh, the continuum dislocation fields. Another postdoc, uh, Phil Mosley did that on the side. Then uh, Max uh, Hodap was doing some validation, I'll show you. Uh, Guillaume Ancio was involved in all the parallel integrated implementation because we now have two codes and we did this intentionally with open source codes. We have LAMPS, open source MD code, and we have Paradis and open source DD code, discrete dislocation dynamics code. And we want these two to talk and we wanna use all the parallel uh, uh, ability of lamps to do large atoms sizes and the parallel uh, capability of uh, Paradis to do many, many dislocation segments or nodes, discretized dislocations. And so this is quite a bit of work in computer science, uh, a side of things, which is where Guillaume Cio is an expert. And then uh, Jae Hoon Cho, as part of his thesis, did increasingly dynamic, complex dynamic problems, which I'll show you. 
So I'm not going to describe most of these pieces. They're operational, they're subtle, uh, and they require some work, but all of the details one can't go through. And when we write papers, we have it all laid out. Now, the current status is that if you go to a discrete dislocation code, there's really no finite element code. If there is, it's very expensive because it's in 3D to solve the boundary value problem. The atomistic continuum coupling is well established in general, but not the solution of FE in the, L, in the DD code. We're focusing on coupling. We're focusing on having a, a dislocation in the atomistic domain bridge with the, atom, with the dislocation in the continuum domain. So to do that, we can simplify the problem slightly. We can use a hybrid approach where we do a total discrete dislocation problem, and then we use that to inform the atomistics. And then we can solve a dislocation problem in infinite space with no boundary conditions and use that to talk to uh, the atomistics. And so this is good. It's excellent for testing. It's good when we only have dislocations and where the far field boundaries, the remote boundaries don't matter. We have dislocations essentially in infinite space. So we find the dislocations in the atomistics. We discretize all the dislocations, both continuum and atomistics in DDD. We compute the displacement fields of all the dislocations via elasticity. Then we impose those displacement boundary conditions on the molecular dynamics box. And then we evolve the dislocation part that's inside the MD by MD. We found it and we set some boundary conditions using continuum, but it really moves by molecular dynamics. And the discrete dislocation system, all of the dislocation parts outside the atomistics move with discrete dislocation dynamics. We have no need to solve a, a, an outer field problem. So this is a simplification um, because we're trying to establish this coupling part of the problem. Okay, so now let's see how we do. Um, oh, in this hybrid, uh, I'm just describing the hybrid again. We have this infinite space domain problem. We solve this, and then we take the solution, the displacement field of this, and impose it on the boundary. And then we let the atoms evolve and we let the DD evolve. So the DD evolves with DD, the atoms evolve with MD, but they talk to one another through a boundary condition. And so over here, we don't have to solve. A, a finite element problem because we're not paying attention to this bound. We're treating this part of the boundary. We're saying, yeah, we'll treat this interaction of the dislocation with the continuum. We'll treat this like a continuum part of a dislocation. But we found this dislocation from the atomistics. Okay, so this part of the dislocation came from the atomistics. It just completed the loop here. Okay, so we validate this doing some simple problems, like a dislocation which is pinned at, on a periodic length. And then if you apply a shear stress, it will try to bow out. And we do this in a periodic geometry. And here's an atomistic representation that we can do fully atomistically. And here's a paradis representation that we do solely in paradis. And we make sure that these two match. And that tells us that um, our description in paradis is matching our atomistic description. And so in paradis, you have something called the core energy that you have to calibrate. And we've done that by looking at this bow out problem very simply. The blue line is the continuum under increasing stress. And the green and red is the atomistic dislocation, which is spread out. And you can see that our description matches quite well. It's a little bit off here, but our description of the continuum dislocation matches the atomistic dislocation. So this is just a matter of calibrating for the core energy of the dislocation in the continuum. So now let's look at some validation of our method. Now let's see if I can get, um, let's see, I wanna get the movie to come up. Let's see if I can, I go ahead and get, I'm not sure what happened. Oh, there we go, okay, it came up. So, here is a, just a problem. We, we take a single straight dislocation at the beginning. It's the same bow out problem. We apply a load and it's going to bow out. Now, if we do this problem fully atomistically under the stress, we get this green curve. And if we do it fully with discrete dislocations, we get the pink curve. And that was sort of our calibration. 
Now what we're going to do is use our coupled method to solve half the problem is atomistics, half the problem is discrete dislocation, but we are finding the dislocation nodes in here so that this, effect, this part can affect this part. So we have the nodes continuing in here. So now we start with a perfectly straight dislocation, and this is a static problem. We apply a stress and it's going to come to equilibrium, and then we just iterate. And so when we iterate, iteration one, two, three, the dislocation is moving forward in both the atomistics and the discrete dislocation regime through this coupling at the interface. And we just iterate until the dislocation stops. And it does that after 20 iterations, and that's what we get. So this is totally atomistic. This is totally continuum. Here's an interface between them. And the final solution we get uh, basically goes in between the atomistics and the paradis. Okay? And this, any deviations here, I mean, these are angstrom deviations. We can't expect to do any better than this. So this shows us that we have the basic algorithms. The coupling is not causing a problem. I'll show you when the coupling does cause a problem in a minute. But of course, this is not, I mean, we just eliminated half the atoms over here. That's not like there's a high computational efficiency. Let's look at a different problem. Uh, I mean, the same problem, but now let's look at a quarter of it being atomistic and three quarters of it being a continuum. And again, we know the reference problem, fully atomistic and fully, atom, fully paradis, fully dislocation. And so here are the dislocation nodes and the segments in between in the continuum. And here's the atomistic part. And now we evolve the system. The, the nodes can move faster, but this is just a static problem. We're iterating to convergence. And after, I don't know how many steps we did, 12 or 13 steps, 13 steps, we come to an iterated solution. And you don't have to worry about these dots here. You can see the, 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 the dislocation line is here, and then we get this continuum result here. And so now here, notice that this dislocation is not an edge dislocation at this point. It's curved. It's got some angle to it. But because our coupling knows about different angles of dislocations, this region of the atom sees the correct atomistic structure here, even though it's not an edge, a simple dislocation. It's a, it's a more complicated uh, dislocation with some angle. So this shows that we're doing more or less the right thing. Now, if we put that node where we're going to realign right at the interface, not inside the atomistics. If we put it right at the interface, this is why it's important, because if you put it at the interface, you have problems. So here we go, and we try to iterate. And we can already see it's lagging behind. That's not may not be a problem, but this is simply not far enough into the atoms to see what's happening. It's already being influenced by the continuum. And here's the final solution. And the final solution is not good, right? There's a kink here that shouldn't belong here. And it's because we put this detection node for, the, for telling the discrete dislocation, <coughs> excuse me, what the atoms are doing. We put it at the interface. And so there are these subtle aspects of the algorithm that we realized in advance and took care of and then we show here that, of course, if we didn't do that, we'd run into a problem. All right, so let's look at some other problems. Uh, this was our dummy interface at the, at the node. Uh, at, the, at the interface, the dummy node, and it gives us problems. It has to be, if I go back here, it has to be just inside. Even if it's just one atomic spacing, that's fine. It just can't be at the interface. So these are algorithmic things, but we want real fidelity, and we have to pay attention to this. Okay. So now let's look at some more movies. So let's look at some validation. We have a straight edge dislocation moving through the material. If our calibration of the discrete dislocation dynamics is fine, if our coupling is fine, if everybody talks together, this dislocation should just move straight under an applied stress. So here's the continuum line. Here's the atomistic domain. Here's the continuum line again. And we're just going to look from a top view and a, and a plan view. Oops, sorry. And here we go. And the dislocation is just moving along. Da 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 da. Everything stays straight, nice and perfect. Okay. 
maybe very slight deviations, but this is as best as we could expect. Now, if we do something wrong, if we tell the discrete dislocations that the dislocation should move twice as fast as what we know is the atomistic value, we create problems. If we don't use any template, if we don't tell the atoms the correct structure, we just give it the, the singular solution projected onto the atoms, the so-called Volterra core, that coupling is not correct. Let's see what happens. In this case, we have the wrong velocity. So the dislocation in the continuum, oops, sorry, dislocation in the continuum is racing ahead and is pulling the other dislo the atomistic dislocation forward. So everything continues to move, move forward, but it's totally incorrect behavior in the atomistic because the dislocation here, we told it to move faster than it should have. Over here, we have this difference in the template. And now we, as we move forward, we see there's a defect here and the dislocation is lagging behind and the behavior here is not, is not good. Overall, the picture doesn't look so bad, but when you look in the detail, it's not very good. And so it's important for the atoms to see the correct atomistic, uh, domain, uh, atomistic domain right outside so that we have a good coupling. And so we can test all of these kinds of coupling issues and, and we can see how important they are. All right, uh, here's another dislocation. This is a, a 30 degree dislocation. Nothing special about an edge. Oops, nothing special about an edge. A 30 de degree dislocation has a different structure, has a different mobility behavior, but everything follows along perfectly well. Okay, so now let's look at some more complicated problems. Let's look at a dislocation loop that we apply a stress and under a high enough stress, the dislocation loop should expand. And so when I look down on the dislocation, I see the loop. There's the Burgers vector. So parts of it are edge and parts of it are screw and parts of it are mixed. And this is the atomistic part. And we're gonna use this hybrid method again. And we, so we don't have to do the full coupling which would require solving an FE problem. So I wanna emphasize that again, but we're gonna look at the motion of this loop under a high stress. All right, so. Here is the stress at the beginning. These nodes are the ones that we're detecting to help us solve the problem. But everything in here is moving by the atoms. It's just that the force of the, the, the stresses due to these atoms are conveyed here through a discrete dislocation. So these, are, these nodes have nothing but they're just kinematic following of the dislocation. And this is the continuum dislocation and these are the nodes. So now we apply a stress that's going to expand this loop. If we don't apply a stress, it'll collapse. We've done that too. The whole thing collapses. And here, if we apply a stress, the dislocation, the loop is expanding, expanding, expanding. We can see it's getting slightly polygonized. This is because the, the velocity of the dislocation has some character dependence that makes it want to have particular angles. So that's not an artifact of the loop. That's a feature that comes from the atomistics that's being manifested here in the continuum solution. And then in the atomistics, you can see that that's rounded out a little bit because it doesn't know that it, you know, the atomistics is not as sharp. But now everybody's keeping up with everybody else. These two sides should be symmetric, even though this is atomistic. And we just keep watching and it's expanding. And now, oops. Sorry, maybe as we go along here, maybe the atoms are trying to get a little bit ahead, just a little bit ahead perhaps of the, of the discrete dislocation. Okay. But everybody's pretty much staying on target. Everybody's moving together. And now as the nice thing in this hybrid method is we can pass the dislocation out, sorry, the movie plays in a certain way. So here, because we can now treat these, at, these parts of the dislocation, we can now move them with the discrete dislocation, even though they're in the atomistics. So what we've shifted is from an atomistic description, because we're very near the interface and the dislocation is going to pass out, that we switch it to a continuum description, and then it just seamlessly passes out into the continuum. So let's watch the rest of it. There it goes, it goes out. This part is still atomistic. These parts are going out. And that's where we ended the simulation.
So we had no problem with this whole loop expanding, going out, and then parts of the atomistic dislocation going out into the continuum and maintaining basically the, the shape of the loop. Again, it's not absolutely perfect, but it's extremely close. Okay, so for our final example, uh, I'll show you a few pictures. This is a Frank Reed source. So a Frank Reed source is a dislocation that's pinned on either side that will then bow out and loop around and close on itself and recreate the source. Now to do that atomistically, you need to actually create a 3D loop. And there's a piece missing here, but here's this is a dislocation, this dislocation, this dislocation. These dislocations will not move because they're not on the glide plane. And only this part of the dislocation will move. And we're going to apply a shear stress and watch this dislocation, watch this Frank Reed source operate in this fully atomistic box. Then we're going to run the same problem where only the atom, only the stuff inside this little red box is atomistic, and outside is the discrete dislocation domain. So now we only need this many atoms instead of this many atoms. Okay. Let's watch the movie for these two, these two uh, systems running at exactly the same time steps and time scale. So we're pushing, the atoms are bowing out, uh, the dislocation is bowing out, we see the atoms. Oops, let me uh, go back for a second. Let me just run the movie. I'll talk you through it. On the right-hand side, the dislocation is passing into the continuum. On the left, it's all atomistics. The dislocations get to the boundary where they're pinned. That's like a, bound, a boundary. They come around, they loop, and they pinch off right there. They pinch off, form a new loop. The old loop goes to the boundary. The new loop keeps expanding. Over here, it's expanding part atomistic, part discrete dislocation. They come around again. They come around again, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, and this one pinches off, that one pinches off, form another source again. And now, because the stress of these two dislocations is pushing back on this little source, the source stops, up, stops operating. It's bowed out because it's under some stress, but it can't move. So this source emitted two dislocations. The two dislocations went to the boundary. They're slightly different at the boundary for atomistic reasons and continuum reasons here. We're not concerned about that. We could deal with that later. We're interested in all of this part. And the stresses from here are acting on this. And the stresses from the continuum dislocation are acting on this source. And the source has been shut down. So it emitted two dislocations and then stopped. And we only dealt with this part atomistically in this problem, in, in the coupled problem. Now, if we look from the top, we can see again from the top, here they are bowing out side by side. We can really see them side by side. And now we see a lot of continuum dislocation on the right. And the atomistics is only really in this part. And right where they're gonna pinch off, pinch off and go out and then operate again. Notice the pinching off here was happening right where the atoms in the continuum are, but that presented no problem. The pinching off happens because we have a dislocation line direction this way, dislocation line direction this way. If they come together, they cancel. They create nothing. And that's why you get the pinch off. Okay. Boom. Second one pinches off. They go to the boundary. And then the system stabilizes. Again, this is like this because these are atomistic boundary. This is a continuum boundary, and they're slightly different. So we get this very nice agreement for this complex problem. And I don't think, I don't have it here, but if you do the problem fully discrete dislocation without any atoms here, the fully discrete dislocation problem emits a third dislocation. And that's because the treatment of the atomistic region right here has some effect on how much it can bow out. These region cannot be neglected atomistically. The curvatures are high and it emerges that in the discrete dislocation, it just doesn't do that accurately enough to prevent, uh, to prevent a third dislocation from coming out. Okay. Now let's look at a fun one. This is a double Frank Reed source. So this section here and this section here can both bow out in opposite directions. So we apply a shear stress, the red one's gonna go left and the blue one to the right. And these are immobile segments here. And this is in an aluminum magnesium. All these green points are magnesium atoms. And then out here is the continuum. 
Again, we've calibrated the continuum to match, but this is going to be on a very high stress. So things are a lot of things are going to happen. Um, but and we're going to look at the close-up view of these two sources bowing out and uh, emitting dislocations at the same time. So here we go. Boom. One, two, three, four. They're emitting these dislocations. They're going out to the boundary. We're dealing only with the atoms, and that handles all the nucleation and the looping around and the annihilation and the atomistic dislocation portions that have to be, you can see these things are waving around and the atoms are waving around. And we're getting this huge emission of dislocations out into the continuum because the only important part was, was the nucleation part, the formation part, the pinch off, which where we need the atoms. And if we look at this now in the whole block, this is now the continuum region. And now you can see we could never do this problem in atomistics. We have no reference for this. We could never do it in fully atomistic. This atom, atomistic box is already pretty big. And now we have this huge domain and we see it operating. And it's such a high load that the dislocations are going out and then another one is, is, is coming out right afterwards. And all of this stuff out here are all the continuum dislocations. In fact, there's so many continuum dislocations that computationally, the continuum part becomes more costly than the atoms. And so this is how far we've gone. So now we're sending out these dislocation pile up dynamically, all coming from this atomistic source. Again, you could do this in DD, right? but you have to be careful that we're not inter we're interested in problems that are even more complicated than this. And which don't involve um, a uh, um, uh, where the atomistics is more complicated. Okay, we're getting along in time. So let me just uh, finish to tell you, remember we did this hybrid method. We didn't solve the full mechanics problem. We really want to solve the full mechanics problem. And so to do that, we need to solve either in the discrete dislocation regime, a 3D finite element solution to get all the correct fields and the boundary conditions. And that is very expensive, solving 3D finite elements. So what we're trying to do is to, is to find an efficient 3D solution using Green's functions. And what we've developed is basically a boundary element method, but we call it the discrete boundary element method because it comes from the atomistics. And so it's intrinsically consistent with the atomistic system. Uh, and so we published one paper uh, on this method and you have to do a data sparse implementation because there's so much uh, storage. And then Ankit Gupta and Max and I are working on this a paper on this discrete uh, boundary element method. So this paper was uh, from uh, last year. So what's the basic idea? I'm just gonna sketch it. I'm not gonna go into detail. You start out with a fully atomistic system and let me find my, uh, my, my pointer, laser pointer, okay. And then there's some sort of defects. And I'll show you just a 2D picture. So there's some sort of defect here and that you need to preserve atomistically. So that's the region where you want full atomistics. And the rest of this are just atoms deforming pretty much elastically. So you really don't need them. And this is the region you can coarsen. So the idea here is to throw away all the atoms except for the atoms on the boundary. And so now we have the atoms on the boundary and the atoms on the pad that are in the continuum that talk to the inner atoms, and then we have the real atoms. So here's the minimum size we want, which is the atomistic size. We're stuck with that. We have to pay the cost of that. And out here, we have these boundary atoms. Now, if this is a big boundary, there's an awful lot of atoms out there, and they're only an angstrom apart. But we want to apply boundary conditions, and we want everything to be consistent between the atoms, atoms out here. The elasticity should be consistent with the, with the uh, description here. And so now what we wanna do is we wanna coarsen, but first, before we coarsen, we can think about Green's functions, that we can say, how does the displacement or force on a boundary atom lead to displacements and forces on the pad atoms? That's a connection that we can make through the Green's function. Then we have the pad atoms, that if I move a pad atom, it influences a pad atom, and the pad atoms influence the real atoms. And that's also can be made as a connection by a Green's function. Or right, the Green's function says, if I apply a force on one atom, what displacement do I get on another atom or another point in space? 
So it's the coupling between forces and displacements through the medium. In this case, the medium is a discrete atomistic system. And so we can get rid of all the degrees of freedom in the middle, all those millions and billions of atoms, and just keep the ones on the boundary and the ones on the inner boundary. So the outer boundary and the inner boundary. And they're connected through, through the Green's functions, okay, which we know for the elastic material. In 3D, we still have way too many atoms on the boundary. And so what we want to do is coarsen that boundary. And that's what Ankit has done successfully. We don't need to keep all the atoms. We can coarsen the problem. And we do that in a kind of a finite element way, coarsening. But we're coarsening the Green's functions. And so we still preserve that if there was a displacement here, where there is no atom, but there's a displacement field, we can still convey that information to the system here. What we're assuming on the outer boundary is that the boundary conditions out here are not varying rapidly on the scale of the coarsening, just like any kind of coarsening method that you would use. You can't have uh, a delta function uh, displacement here. You have to have some sort of smooth displacements. But now we have many fewer atoms on the boundary and we make almost no real approximation. You can't tell the difference between the coarsening and the uncoarsened because of the way the coarsening is done, but we have many fewer degrees of freedom. And so the long range interactions are easily coarsened. So how does this talk to this? We know the continuum Green's functions, and then we have the short range results and we can have a controlled accuracy with the coarsening. And then we can use hierarchical matrices also to control the accuracy. And because the Green's function matrix, which connects different points, whether they're coarsened or not, is a dense matrix, it still requires quite a bit of storage. But if you use a hierarchical matrix, matrix formula, formulation, you can decrease the storage, decrease the accuracy, but in a controlled way that's related to um, the, the nature of the matrices. And this is not unlike a multipole expansion. So this is what we're working on now so we can solve the full 3D mechanics problem everywhere in space with outer boundary conditions and take advantage of all the stuff I showed you that's happening in the atomistics and at this scale. Okay, so uh, this CAD 3D is going to be, right, we're still developing it, a useful computational uh, tool for connecting atomistic domains where you have to keep the atoms to a larger domain, particularly where there's dislocation plasticity going on. We have the general methodology and the algorithms developed. We know how a continuum dislocation can talk to an atomistic dislocation using this template. Um, we have calibration and we have new approach to accurately calibrate atomistics and discrete dislocation dynamics for the core energies even better than what I showed you. And we have this general implementation and I showed you a lot of test problems of increasing complexity, dislocations emitting, passing from the continuum from the atomistics to the continuum. And now we're working on this efficient Green's function method as the final step to solve full 3D problems without using uh, FEM methods that are just far too expensive computationally and storage-wise. So we're almost there, uh, achieving our goals for a robust, validated, and general 3D method for coupling atoms to a continuum with dislocations going back and forth between the, between the two phases. With that, I'll stop and we can take questions. Thanks for your attention. Sorry to go on a little bit long. I tend to speak a little more slowly uh, when there's no, no people to look at because I'm afraid people get lost. If I see you in person, I can see you're lost or I can see you're not lost. Thanks very much. Yeah, Tom? thanks for the curtain. Yeah, uh, it was a very interesting talk. So uh, I think we'll take questions now. We have a couple of questions already in the Q&A box, which okay. I can relate to you. The first question is from Kais Ali. So he's asking, uh, this is, I think, regarding the, uh, the Frank Reed source operation that you showed. Yep. He was asking, like, what material system it is, like, what kind of a... Oh, uh, sorry uh, about that. Right. So material. So uh, this material is, is aluminum uh, using what's called the Erkelesi atoms uh, interatomic potential for aluminum. And uh, one of the reasons we use aluminum is because aluminum is very isotropic. 
And the current discrete dislocation methods are mainly organized for isotropic uh, dislocations. And so we use a system where the material is largely isotropic. So this is aluminum. We could have used anything else. And here we actually use an aluminum magnesium alloy. And out here, the continuum is a, uh, an average value of this alloy quite precisely. And this material we can actually make quite isotropic. Okay, uh, so uh, guys, if you have a follow-up question, you can uh, type into the Q&A box. And uh, I have another question from uh, Rajat Pratap Singh. So I think uh, it's, it's best if you can ask the question directly. So Rajat, uh, I'll allow you to talk on, uh, I'll, uh, yeah, I have, I'll, I have allowed you to talk. So if, uh, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes. Um... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can, hi. I can hear uh, thank you for your yeah. talk. Yeah, so my question is why we are not using like a, a coarse graining at the interface between uh, uh, atomistic and discrete dislocation. Like if we can right. use uh, adaptive coarse graining, which increase its size of cell as we go far from the, the atomistic cell, then it would be more accurate, I think. Though the computational cost will increase, but uh, the accuracy would be more. In my opinion. So, so there, there are two parts to the question, uh, or two aspects. The first is for accurate continue for accurate atomistic continuum coupling. Um, say even way back here, you have to mesh the problem down to the atomistic scale. If you don't do that, you just start introducing errors in the coupling right away because you're, you have some deformation gradient here, you're trying to match it here. As a dislocation comes toward the interface, it's deforming the material. If you coarsen that, then you're out of luck, right? Um, you, and we can show that. And so you cannot really, you really have to start at the interface level by coarsening atomistically. Right? Now, this picture that I show here in 2D, right, is showing, let me see if I can blow it up, in 2D, indeed, uh, I have to blow it up, but then make it smaller. <laughs> uh, and I can't move it around because I don't have the cursor. So here we are using, of course, a graded, a graded mesh. And the elements out here are very large because they're far from the atomistics. They're far from the boundaries. And the dislocations, this, there's a corrective field for the dislocation. We don't have to resolve the dislocation fields individually um, on this mesh. So we. We use a coarse graining in the meshing here in 2D. In fact, you can even do it more, uh, more elegantly by going to Green's functions in 2D because you can invert these matrices and, and the Green's functions are dense, but they're not large. In 3D, it's the need to have to start at the atomic scale and mesh outward. Even if you coarsen quickly, it is still an absolutely uh, you know, immense problem because you want these, you want the outer problem to be microns, many microns in size, maybe even larger. And you'd like to even go to a, 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 a even, even larger sizes. And so the uh, coarsening in 3D you can do, uh, but you have to start at the atomic scale. And as a consequence, the cost just becomes phenomenal. When you go to the Green's functions, you don't have any coarsening. Um, when, you're, when, you're, when you take this step in the Green's function, you have the pad, which is atomistic, and then there's nothing here. Right? There, there's no coarsening, there's no mesh, there's no nothing. There is only the atoms on the outer boundary where you're applying the boundary conditions. And then if you coarsen that, now you have no coarsening. I mean, uh, when, you get, when you do the boundary element method, the coarsening is only what you do on the boundary here. And we still have to keep this part fully atomistic. Otherwise, we're gonna introduce errors when we try to solve the atomistic problem. Okay? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, so we have uh, uh, another question from uh, Lai Zhang. So I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, unmute him. So Lei, you can go ahead and ask the question. Oh. Please unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, how are you? Yeah, Bill, it's, it's Lei. And, yes, uh, Lei, is, Lei is following my dislocation mechanics course. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So I, I would like to ask uh, you, for the current uh, uh, CAD 3D work, can it work uh, works uh, for the uh, crack problem? Um, well, we haven't we haven't done it yet, and uh, the Green's functions. If you have a crack, then you have this. You know, you'd have to have the Green's function sort of for the cracked region, and so there's some tricks you have to pay, play uh, to handle to handle a crack problem because it's an internal an internal interface. Um, or uh, or an external interface that for the, where the continuum greens function um, you have to be careful about you know you don't transmit forces from one side of the crack face across to the other side of the crack face so at the moment we're not uh, we're not trying to do cracks uh, th th these things can all be all be done in the end um, but we're starting with the simpler simpler geometries yeah, yeah, because I noticed that in two D case you can you can include the uh, include the crack uh, already included the crack. Uh, for right, your, that's uh, because because in two D we can do finite elements, right? It, it's it's computationally effective, so we can create this domain, we can mesh it, we can have the traction free surfaces, we can have the fine mesh and the coarse mesh, and we're just solving it essentially with finite elements. Uh, yeah. In three D, in three D, we can't. We can't do that. And but the Green's functions in 3D, you know, normally are for an infinite space, and then you correct, you know, then you can impose boundary conditions. But when you have a, a, a crack, it's partially like a half space problem and partially like a full space problem. So, so the trick in it with a crack actually is to treat it like two half spaces, solve the half space problems and couple them in the middle where they're where they're tied together, and then where the crack is. It's just the half space. So then you can use half space Green's functions. So you, like I said, there are tricks to, 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 to do that still involving the Green's functions, um, but you have to get away from the infinite space Green's functions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks for your uh, answer. Yep, sure, thank you. Okay, so there are no more questions in the Q&A box. If anybody else has a question, uh, can you raise your hand? Or, okay, there is another one from uh, uh, Kais Ali. So I think I'll unmute him so that he can ask the uh, question. Kais, I have uh, allowed Hi. you to talk. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks other, for the other person for... following my class. Hi, Kais. Yeah, hi. Uh, so thanks for answering the question previously about aluminum system, which you are studying. I was wondering, like, uh, so in one of your slides, you show that uh, interface is fixed. And uh, I'm not sure whether I'm going in the right direction, but are we capturing the micro scale information in particular if the interface is movable or grain bond move, moving grain boundary, for example, while at the same time we're coupling atom sticks with the continuum? Yeah. So, um... So I tend to think of problems uh, with fixed interfaces. Moving the interfaces is, is, is more of a uh, algorithmic issue than, an oper than, a, than a fundamental issue. Um, because if I look at, again, the 2D problem, there's lots of, lots of these kind of questions that, that one can address in 2D. So look at this 2D problem. If I wanna make the atomistic domain here bigger, right? Well, I already know the displacement field out here in the continuum. And I know what it is from the continuum solution. So I can just add atoms and make my atomistic size bigger and put the atoms in exactly the correct positions and create a new pad domain out here. Do you see my cursor? I think so. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. Okay, sorry, it's waving around a little bit. And so, in fact, it's easy to, uh, easy conceptually to add atoms to the system. And if I wanna subtract atoms from the system, that's easy too. I just keep some of the atoms as nodes for the finite element, I throw away all the other ones, and then I have the atoms and I have their position, I have their displacement, and I've made the atomistic system smaller. Now, and so doing the, uh, um, on, you know, doing this on the fly in an integrated way is, is quite difficult um, uh, algorithmically. And so um, 
my preferred situation is to think of setting up a set of problems at different sizes to begin with. And then when the size I have isn't big enough, I just take all that information imported into the bigger size problem and, and run that problem. I don't have to make this one into that one. I just extract all the information, all the, all the displacements of all the atoms, all the nodes, all the positions of all the dislocations, take it, import it into the bigger problem, no, and no problem. And so it's, it's like a poor man's uh, uh, um, refinement problem, but it, it's, uh, avoids all of the algorithmic stuff of moving. Now, if I had a grain boundary in here, say that was moving and had to move out of the atomistic domain, that would be a little bit uh, harder because we we're, we're, haven't worried about those kind of things yet. Right. Thank you. Okay. So, Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, is there any other question from the audience? Uh, there is, a, I don't see anything else in the Q&A box. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Again, it's okay. Admiral. Francisco has a question. Oh, okay. Ten o'clock at night, Friday night. <laughs> well, it's ten, yeah, uh, yeah, ten o'clock for you. Yeah. I mean, somebody had a question. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, Francisco has a question, so I'll uh, I'll unmute him. Francisco, go ahead. Can you ask the question? Francisco, are you there? Oh, maybe we okay, I, I don't know if he's able to. Uh, I can read out the question. So he's asking, is CAD 3D open source? And how easy is it to implement or use? For example, the Frank Reed source simulations like Cho did. Uh, so, um, so the goal is to make it open source. where, And that's why we're using the open source uh, software, the, the um, LAMPS and Paradis. Uh, it, the, all the stuff that connects, all this work that Guillaume Ancio has done um, to connect everything makes it you know, less, uh, well, more unwieldy than one would like. And so the intention is, is to make it uh, open source in the future. Um, it's not in a state now where we could just hand it to somebody and they could run a problem that they wanna run. Um, it just, it's just not there yet. Um, and uh, Guillaume Ancio has continued to work on it toward that goal. Uh, we'd like to get the greens function stuff working because that allows one to do boundary value problems, not infinite space problems. And so, um, and also we need more funding. Uh, Guillaume needs, needs more funding to work on it. But so the goal is open source so that people can use it. But like any code, it's not gonna be a, to be used by people who really know what they're doing. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think that's it. With the, I, I had one question. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, so this is regarding the pad atoms. So uh, yeah. the, the, the way you introduce the pad atoms, if I understood it right, is, uh, is based on what the continuum dislocations are doing. Like for example, if I have a, a dislocation loop, then you introduce the, the 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 positions of the atoms in the pad are determined by the uh, the the Burgess vector of the continuum dislocation, right? right. So in some sense, you are, the continuum dislocation is driving the atomistics uh, and not the other way around. Um, is that uh, well, the 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 dislocations moving in the atomistic domain in the in the in the three D case, right? Uh, Let's just try to go. Yeah. You know, when I, when I have a picture like this, right? What I'm what what I'm doing is, yes, the the boundary condition for the atomistics is the displacement field due to these dislocations, and you might think it's fixed, but of course the dislocations, the forces on these dislocations know about what's happening in the atomistics, so they're going to move knowing what happens in the atomistics, and the atoms are moving knowing what it was. Oh, okay what it was in the continuum at the last increment, right? And because it's incremental, everybody's always keeping up. So it really is fully coupled that the atoms are telling the DD what it thinks they should do. And the DD is telling the atoms what they think, what the DD thinks the atoms should do. And the two are, are moving along, right? 
Um, okay, and if this is done seamlessly, then uh, basically the two should go in sync. Right, and uh, all those that's examples that's I was trying that. to show you, you know, these are the static examples, these are the dynamic, you know, test cases. You see everybody, except when we, we intentionally make errors, right, intentionally make an error, then you see there's a problem. But anytime yes. we do everything the way we think we should do it, we see very little uh, discontinuity between the two. So we think it's okay. about as seamless as one can get. Okay. And the, the other thing was about, uh, so the, the, uh, the simulations are, uh, the, uh, the atomistic simulations are run at zero temperature or at They're finite right. temperature? Uh, because I believe the continuum simulations don't have a temperature in it, right? So no. atomistic is so, also run at uh, zero temperature? Right. So this was all t equals zero. Now, when you're, when you're doing finite temperature, however, um, Hello? you just, you can just uh, calibrate your dislocation dynamics to the correct uh, temperature, right? And so um, the, uh, there's a little bit of thermal expansion, the Burgers vector will change a little bit, the mobility of the dislocation is temperature dependent, but we, we know how to determine all of these things. And so I think of it as, as, as in principle isothermal, right? We're not gonna deal with problems where we've got large temperature changes sweeping through the material. And dislocation plasticity dissipates energy, but it does not generate a lot of heat. So there's, unless you're really doing a dynamic experiment, you're not, you're not generating a lot of heat. And so we can, it's best to think about it as isothermal, that we could do it at finite temperature. We just have to put in the, the correct dislocation behavior at finite temperature. Oh, okay. But we wouldn't change okay. the temperature so, during the simulation. Okay. Okay. So it seems like there are no more questions from the audience. So uh, okay. in that case, I uh, will thank Professor Curtin once again for uh, giving this talk. Thanks very much. Appreciate yeah. everybody coming uh, at, uh, like I said, uh, late at night for those of you in India. Maybe for Francesco, it's just Friday afternoon, but uh, appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. See you. Bye, Sham. We'll be in touch.